It is my pleasure today to welcome you to the Allergy and Asthma Network's 2016 webinar series titled Advances in Allergy and Asthma. My name is Sally Schessler. I'm the Network's Director of Education. It is my pleasure to welcome you today to this month's offering in our year-long webinar series. We bring you nationally respected speakers each month to talk about issues that are important to you. Please plan to join us each month. For our September webinar, we are presenting Website versus Bedside Manner, Telehealth for Allergy and Asthma Care. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Tanya Elliott as our speaker today. Dr. Elliott is Medical Director at Doctor on Demand and has been with the team since January 2014. She is board certified in internal medicine and allergy immunology. She completed her medical degree at Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia, her residency at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City, and fellowship at Winthrop University Hospital on Long Island. She is passionate about improving access to care and empowering patients to make informed decisions. Dr. Elliott also holds a position as clinical instructor at NYU School of Medicine and attending at Bellevue Hospital Center. Dr. Elliott has published multiple papers on allergic skin and respiratory disease and has been a guest lecturer at the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. She is also a recipient of the college's first place Von Perquette Award for her research on allergic diseases. Dr. Elliott, we're so pleased to have you with us today and look forward to hearing what you have to say. Great. Thanks, everybody, and uh, thanks to the Allergy and Asthma Network for having me. Uh, so just a quick disclosure slide. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to just give a little bit of a perspective on tele uh, technology and medicine, review the current telemedicine landscape, uh, address uh, some issues relating to telemedicine sustainability and specifically government and public support for it, uh, talk through a couple of use cases and telehealth success stories, and then just address where we are uh, with allergy and telehealth today and where we need to be. So let's just give a perspective on technology. So if all other industries moved as quickly as technology has, here's where we would be today. So, in 1971, the fastest car was the Daytona Ferrari. The largest building was the Twin Towers. And Intel launched the first microprocessor chip, which is a computer that took up an entire room. If the automotive industry has moved as quickly as the technologically industry, they, the, tech, uh, the tech industry, cars would be traveling at one-tenth the speed of light. The largest building would reach halfway to the moon. Um, and look at tech today. Three billion people carry smartphones in their pocket, each more powerful than a room-sized computer, and countless industries have been upended by digital disruption. Healthcare is next. Um, so here's another uh, interesting thing just to kind of put technology into perspective today. So if somebody from the 1950s suddenly appeared today, what would be the most difficult thing to explain to them about life? I possess a device in my pocket that's capable of accessing the entirety of information known to man. Thank you very much to Google. Um, and I use it to look at pictures of cats and get in arguments with strangers. All right, so healthcare has done a lot. I don't want to put it down too much. So here are the innovations in healthcare products. There's no doubt that we've had uh, a number of great advances here with Tamiflu being developed in 1997 as the, one of the most recent ones. And we've also had a, just a, an overall change in the way that we approach healthcare. We go from doctors knows best to now patient or relationship-centered care and joint decision-making. We went from encyclopedias and textbooks to internet searches and apps, paper charts and telephone. Um, and I apologize to some of you who may still be on paper charts, but now we have mandated EMRs, web portals, e-prescribe, and text and email with patients. I think we can argue that innovation in service delivery is stagnant. Um, there's certainly been innovations in delivery in products and, and devices and in a number of other industries, but traditional healthcare really lags in terms of the service delivery. And we know that healthcare costs continue to rise. And we know that our healthcare spend is out of proportion to other countries. This is just another depiction of this, but we are way out of proportion for spend, and that doesn't necessarily relate to quality and service. So 18% of our US GDP is spent on healthcare, 
but 100,000 Americans die every year due to medical error alone. And the average time to an appointment is approximately three weeks. So how can technology help to save healthcare? So again, giving us some perspective, more than half of smartphone users use their smartphones to get health information. And they also do it to do a number of tasks that, remember, 15, 20 years ago had to be done in person. So think about online banking. Think about the housing industry and you know, looking up uh, various real estate options. All of those things needed to be done in, perfect, in person. 62% um, of people, so even more so than those that do online banking, get information about a health condition. And we know that the mobile usage for health continues to rise. So this is looking at year over year growth rate. Health and fitness rising year over year at 89%, well above the average. So my argument is the time has come. We certainly live in a tech savvy world. 90 per, more than 90% of Americans have internet access. More than 55% use it for online banking and shopping. Um, and the majority of Mer uh, Americans own a smartphone. And we also know that there's a patient preference piece of this, as well as a consumer consumerism. We already talked about how we have patient-driven decisions and, and patient-centered care. And I'd like to make that more of a relationship-centered care, as opposed to a patient coming in and sort of mandating what they want done because they've looked up something on the internet. So let's meet them halfway and have relationship-driven decisions and use technology as a, as a platform to approach that. Um, we also know that, you know, costs for patients and the structure of reimbursement has changed. So their average deductible is $1,700. Um, so, you know, what does this mean? That they're going to start being smart consumers, just like, you know, when people go shopping, they're cutting out coupons um, and bringing them to the stores. Well, uh, patients are now going to be smart consumers and looking for low-cost, high-quality care. Um, and, you know, just looking at a survey, greater than 75% of patients express a desire for on-demand medical care. Um, and a recent study actually just came out that showed that more than 90% of employers do plan to provide telehealth as an option for their uh, employees. Um, we know that there are major unmet needs in the, in the U.S. healthcare system, unsustainable costs, variation in quality, um, and oftentimes a poor value to consumers. So, before we kind of get into how telehealth and tele, um, telemedicine can truly disrupt and improve healthcare, we sort of need to understand mobile development and some terminology. So the first thing is user experience. What is that? That's a patient's perceptions and responses that result from the use of or anticipated use of a product or a, serv a service. Uh, so, you know, I'm here in Silicon Valley at Doctor on Demand headquarters. It's all about the user experience and delighting the user. So what does that mean? Uh, meet the exact needs of a customer without fuss or bother. Uh, product, um, produce a product that just possess simplicity, elegance, and are a joy to own and a joy to use. And as I'm reading these things out, just think about if a patient actually thought about healthcare in this way. Um, we certainly don't have patients talking about the healthcare system being a joy to use um, or going above and beyond uh, what people say that they want. Um, and then merge seamlessly, in, you know, the services and multiple disciplines together. An excellent user experience correlates with utilization. Why do patients not want to go to the doctor? Well, it's an inconvenience, and they, more often than not, don't have a delightful experience. But if we can create a delightful experience and leverage our technology to recruit patients to interact with us, then perhaps we can have more patient engagement. So here is just um, Uber's, which is the ultimate example of the most delightful user experience. Uber is the future. It's great. It's the greatest experience ever. Can you imagine if this were the same for healthcare? So here are some reviews for a digital health application that has uh, on-demand video visits. Uh, you know, just tried this for the first time. It worked perfectly. It was amazing to be treated and get my prescription without ever leaving my house. Thanks for a great experience. Uh, the future, five stars, saves time and all the hassles of scheduling an appointment, driving, parking, waiting for a visit with a doctor. Definitely feels like how the future of medicine will be conducted. This app changed my life. So happy my friend told me about it. I feel like I would die without it now with a little heart emoji.
this is the future of healthcare. So I would argue that video via mobile certainly creates a cycle of humane care. Um, it increases access to care. Physicians are more engaged. Patients are certainly more satisfied. And doctor-patient relationships are improved. And sometimes, you know, physicians who, you know, want to come work for us say, well, how can you develop a doctor-patient relationship just through a, a computer? You're separated by a device. You're separated by thousands of miles. But, you know, the physician is completely engaged. There's 100% interaction without any interruption. And all of our doctors who are employed physicians with our practice say that they're, they had that hesitation going in, and they certainly don't have that now and there's really not much of a difference between the in-person conversation that they have with the patient and that conversation that they have when they leverage video technology and I just you know would have you think about you know pictures you take through your phone and you're amazed at how uh, you know vivid the, the picture is or videos that you take um, you know it's the same thing when you're using this the video technology it's very high level and the whole goal of it, both for the physician and the patient, is to forget about the device that's allowing you to do this and just focus on that doctor-patient relationship. So, um, you know, the one of the heads at British Telecom Global Government and Health states, telehealth brings together our healthcare experience with the power of communication to transform people's lives. Okay, so I think I've made the argument that the technology and the demand exist. So, what are we supposed to do with it? It's certainly not as simple as Skyping with a patient, right? We have to understand how to adapt physical examination, bedside manner, which what I like to now call screen side or website manner, documentation, and how does that work for um, a video technology or telehealth platform, and clinical decision making. What can we treat and what is not appropriate for treatment through a, a, a telemedicine model? Um, I'll show you some data later that certainly support that telehealth will play a role in the management of chronic disease. Um, and it's really important, you know, for us as a community to understand that guidelines need to be established within our specialty, the power of video medicine, and improve outcomes for our patients. And we'll get into this a little bit in a moment, but I believe that allergy subspecialty is unique. We need environmental context and the ability to see things in real time. Um, you know, our conventions are to rely on history alone, um, but we know as allergists that the number one treatment for allergic diseases is avoidance. Well, wouldn't it be great to actually see that context, see what, where the patient lives, what their external environment is? So in some ways, video medicine is a value add for allergists. So we'll go to definitions of different telehealth modalities. Um, so there are three types of technologies that all kind of fall into telehealth, and you'll see me throughout the presentation, I'm using telehealth and telemedicine synonymously, and we'll get to the formal definition in a moment, but here are the three buckets. So there's store and forward technology, so that's images, video, or sound captured and then uploaded by a patient or a clinic, and then reviewed by a specialist, and this is considered asynchronous, so meaning not in real time. So Easiest store and forward technology that I could think of is a patient takes a picture of a rash um, that they no longer have um, you know, by the time they come in and see you, and then they say, oh, I don't have that rash anymore, but I took a picture of it on my smartphone. Here it is. And then that's the simplest version of it. The most complex uh, you know, of it is cell scope and clinic cloud, which are two what we call peripheral devices. Cell scope is an otoscope that attaches to the iPhone that actually records video of the tympanic membrane, and that gets uploaded to the physician for review. Clinic Cloud is a commercially available uh, stethoscope, so the patient uh, strategically places it on their chest and back, uploads the heart and lung sounds, the physician can then review. So that's store and forward technology. Then we have telemonitoring, so again the basic form of that is really the cardiac monitor when you get it sent home with a telemetry monitor. Um, and so that's to monitor measurements, so the measurements are happening in real time, but um, the review of those is happening at a later date. Um, so heart rate, blood pressure, glucometer, again, this is async messaging. And then clinical video consultation, so video consults and things that are face-to-face, -face, and these are considered synchronous. So when somebody's talking about practicing telehealth or practicing telemedicine, they tend to be talking about the, the uh, um, on-demand or face-to-face -face synchronous video consultations. And then we certainly have our apps, which are considered our M Health or mobile health technology, and a number of these will leverage some of that store and forward uh, technology as well. 
So as I just noted, telehealth encompasses a number of technologies. The formal definition is the use of technology to, del to deliver health care, health information, or health education at a distance. The practice of telemedicine has been declared by the Federation State Medical Boards and the AMA as face-to-face -face evaluations, either virtually through real-time audio and video technology. So really just, um, you know, uh, drives home the point that uh, in order to be considered a true, you know, telemedicine practice, it needs to include video. So it's not picking up the phone and having a conversation with the patient. So what is our current scope of telemedicine? Bet you didn't know this, but there are currently 200 telemedicine networks, 3,500 service sites in the U.S., and the VA is actually one of the hospital systems that adapted this pretty early on. And so in the year 2011, that was five years ago, they conducted over 300,000 remote consultations using telemedicine. Currently, over half of all U.S. hospitals use some form of telemedicine. So certainly the, the laws are in the pipeline um, and they continue to evolve. Uh, so state by state, they differ. And some states are more telemedicine friendly than others. Uh, I can tell you that Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas are probably the least telemedicine friendly. Um, currently, uh, telemedicine is being conducted through video in the state of Texas. Louisiana just became live. Um, Arkansas should be live by uh, this fall. So Medicare and Medicaid uh, do support the use of telehealth and telemedicine, and um, particularly in certain specialties over other specialties. But CMS recently released new Medicaid rules that push Medicaid plans to cover their provider networks and allow for telemedicine as a means to do so. 75% of commercial payers offer telemedicine reimbursement, and accreditation exist. So again, you're not just going to Skype with a patient. You want to work with a system or a platform that's accredited. So there's the American Telemedicine Association accreditation. There's a National Committee for Quality Assurance and the Utilization Review Accreditation um, Commission. Okay, so FAQs, again, relating to commercial insurance. So believe it or not, 30 states actually require that private insurers cover telehealth the same as how they cover in-person services. So we're not going to be living in a world where we're worried or biting our nails as to whether or not this is going to be reimbursed or whether or not it's going to be accepted. It, it's actually required in a number of states. And many other insurers cover at least some telehealth service, and many more have certainly expressed interest in expanding their telehealth coverage. Medicare reimburses for live interactive consultations, office visits, individual psychotherapy, and pharmacologic management delivered through a telemedication, uh, telecommunication system for patients located in non-metropolitan statistical areas. So nearly all rural counties, you have Medicare backing to support telehealth services. So there are some currently accepted practices across the board. There have been guidelines established. There's literature to support it. Teledermatology and I trained at Winthrop Hospital. We specialize in allergic skin diseases. There is so much overlap between what they're doing in teledermatology and what we could be doing in the allergy space. There's absolutely no question. Um, telepsychiatry, tele-ICU, and telestroke. So I wanted to just bring up teledermatology, uh, a case study, and, and what's going on. So American Academy of Dermatology has come out with a mission statement around this. They say that telemedicine is an innovative, rapidly evolving method of care delivery. The Academy supports the appropriate use of telemedicine as a means of improving access to the expertise of board-certified dermatologists to provide high-quality, high-value care. Telemedicine can also serve to improve patient care coordination and communication between other specialties in dermatology. The Academy strongly supports coverage and payments for telemedicine services by board certified dermatologists. So I just pulled this recently from the literature just published in uh, JAMA Dermatology last February. They randomized 156 children and adults with atopic dermatitis to in-person versus online asynchronous communication. So they weren't even using a video visit. They had a photograph uploaded and she had completed, and there was no difference in treat treatment outcomes. So the allergist dilemma. 
We know that there are shortage of allergists across the country. I'm pulling data from the 2012 AI Physician uh, Workforce Report, but recent data uh, shows that there are currently 5,692 allergists that are board certified. Uh, we're unable to tell how many of those are actually practicing, but the estimate is about 4,000, and the average age is 52. So here's the distribution, and it certainly is um, not, you know, congregant across the United States, and there are certainly areas where there are gaps in allergist coverage. But allergists are interested in technology, and that's why you guys are here today listening to my presentation. Um, so, you know, even looking back, uh, you know, in 2009 and 2010, 50% of you guys were using uh, email more than once a day, so that's a good thing, and using a smartphone, and back in the day, remember what that PDA was, uh, you know, 34% of people were, were utilizing that. Um, only 9% were using electronic references. Now, when we look at new data published in 2015 and 2016, we're going to see an exponential increase in those numbers, but um, I have faith in our specialty that we are ready and primed to continue to utilize technology and really leverage it to advance our specialty. Um, and we do have some publications, so where are we today? Uh, there was a Cochrane review uh, published in April of 2016 looking at all forms of remote monitoring for asthma management. And this included telephone as well, which again is currently not really accepted standard practice, although there is some great work doing with, you know, being done right now with uh, telephone follow-ups for compliance and things like that. Um, so six studies, 2,100 patients. And is basically non-inferiority, so the evidence does not demonstrate any important difference between face-to-face -face and remote asthma checkups in terms of exacerbations, asthma control, or quality of life. And then Dr. Portnoy recently published an article just a week ago, um, you know, with a headline that telehealth is as effective as in-person for children with asthma. So we're making strides. So how can we leverage telehealth for allergy coordination of care? What are some allergy use cases? So second opinions, right? And this is just going to expand our scope of practice. So patients can be, um, you know, there's a couple of ways to look at this. One is that you can serve as a, a subspecialist, uh, second opinion in a community utilizing a video platform. And the other is looking at some of these on-demand services as referral bases. So there's American Well, MD Live, Doctor On Demand, those are probably the biggest players in the telemedicine space. So they're getting these patients that are coming in through the door, and I'll show you in a moment the top five diagnoses, but you can certainly hop on the bandwagon and say, hey, when you, you know, determine that this patient needs an allergy evaluation, I'm available. So a lot of allergists who maybe don't have a web presence or an online presence, you can leverage the current telehealth options out there to sort of bring you online and just make yourself available for those um, additional referrals. Um, and allergist-driven care would be the second bucket for this. And so SAS, which is software as a service platform, you can follow up with your own patients on this. And certainly this is helpful for your patients who may be traveling four or five hours just to come and see you because you don't have a, an office nearby. Um, and then the opportunity for physician extenders. So coordinate care with asthma educators, respiratory therapists, case management who conduct in-home visits where you can really just, you know, on demand communicate with them and they could also get on the platform and expand their scope. So as opposed to driving, you know, and spending hours and hours in the car to hit maybe four or five in-person visits, imagine hopping onto a video platform and having your uh, queue of, you know, your 50 visits for the day where you're going through asthma management techniques and, um, you know, just doing home assessments and things, but from the comfort of your own home. So there's certainly long-term present potential for chronic disease management. So here are the top five conditions treated through video platform. These are the top five telemedicine diagnosis. So we're kind of, we're talking now about the big players in the space. So sort of the direct-to-consumer or employer uh, 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 solutions for telemedicines. Um, cough, URI, sinusitis, rash, and then quote-unquote allergies, whatever that means, right? Um, the majority of these use cases, and I can tell you because I've done over 7,000 on-demand video visits myself, are prime for allergy, absolutely prime for allergy evaluation. There's tremendous potential to increase allergy awareness in this patient population, 
coordinate care with allergists nationwide. So like I said, if you're not interested in doing telemedicine and hopping on a platform yourself, certainly just making yourself available to some of these national organizations and saying, hey, when you're, you have determined that this patient has had three sinus infections or four sinus infections in a year, they probably need an immunodeficiency workup. So please refer them to me. So here are some advantages of video versus the office. So again, this, whole, this concept of home environmental assessment. So when a patient comes into your office, most of us will have them fill out a checklist. Do you have carpeting in your bedroom? Do you have pets in your home? Do you have upholstered furniture, right? We have them sit there for 20 minutes and figure out this checklist. When they connect to you through video from their home, why not just walk them, have them walk you through their home so you can identify those potential triggers yourself? I would argue that you're probably going to identify more triggers than the patient would have anticipated. Maybe you're seeing that they have a huge wood burning fireplace. Maybe you're seeing that they have huge candles with soot all over them. And now we're identifying some of those non-allergic triggers. Would we have identified those just by having a patient fill out a checklist in our office? Probably not. And could that potentially contribute to our improvements? I would argue yes. Um, the ability to see an allergic reaction in real time. How many times have you seen a patient who said, oh my gosh, doc, I had the worst allergic reaction ever. I had a rash all over my body. It was terrible. And you say, oh gosh, I hope this person has pictures because I have no idea. My differential diagnosis right now is five different things. Um, so wouldn't it be great if you could actually see it in real time and make that diagnosis right away using video? Um, and then the other piece of it is, again, these patients are, you know, frequent flyers to urgent care or they're going to their ENT or they're going to their primary care doctor, right? They're going all over the place. And so, you know, we know that primary immune deficiency is underdiagnosed. My theory is actually that because patients are now accessing um, physicians through a video visit and there's, there's just that convenience issue that we're going to see the patients with recurrent uh, infections calling in through these services and we would say you know you guys you've had three or four recurrent infections and you're coming in through this video platform multiple times you are candidates for an immunodeficiency workup and so making telemedicine doctors and these big practices aware we're gonna see an increase of referrals and hopefully more accurate diagnoses of primary immune deficiency this way in an urgent care you know there are multiple urgent cares spread out across the country there's no way that we'd be able to capture those patients that are frequenting those urgent cares and saying, hey, you should be triggered for a workup for primary immune deficiency. So we're really able to carry this out on a large scale national level, uh, level here. So here are some other use cases. Again, we sort of reviewed you know, the flares for you know, allergic rhinitis and asthma. We can assess environmental triggers. We can do follow-up visits for step up and step down therapy. Dermatitis flare, so not just, you know, it's, it's certainly easy to hop onto a video and, and see whether or not eczema is active or not. But the other cool piece of a video visit from someone's home is review their skincare regimen, right? I've had patients come into my office and bring in a whole bag of skincare products. Well, you know what, through the video, I'm going to ask them to walk into their bathroom and show me their whole array of skincare products, and then we're going to identify what's old, what's expired, what might be contributing to their symptoms. Um, food allergy and other opportunities. So think about some of our nutritionists potentially coming on the platform and saying, instead of having to wait three months to get in to see a nutritionist to review how to read food labels, why not do that from the home, starting what's currently in your pantry and identifying some foods that you need to throw out. So this is my, uh, one of my last slides here, just device and lab integration. So this is the future of telemedicine. Uh, I mentioned before the use of peripherals, so CellScope, which is the Otoscope, Clinic Cloud, Heart and Lung Sounds. I should have you know that these things are available now at Best Buy. Laboratory data um, and the capability of ordering laboratory tests through the video platforms. We have apps. We have a wide array of, a variety of tools that will allow us to uh, address a, a larger scope of con disease states and conditions from the smartphone, this phone in a patient's home on their terms. So how do you incorporate telemedicine into your current practice? What are you going to look for? So gave my you know, quick steps to how you would want to go about assessing a, a platform um, to sort of get involved. So you want to make sure that whatever platform you're looking at has video capabilities, appointment scheduling, EMR integration, 
document management, which is another important feature, which is the capability of the patient to sort of upload previous documents and things that they have for you to be able to see. Robust IT support, so that's really important. You know, what the, what's the use of a technology if you don't know how to use it? Um, and then robust patient and, you know, clinician and clinical support. So just on the back end, you know, who's the patient going to, you know, reach out to if there's, you know, a question or a glitch on their end as well. So that's it. This is next generation, not just telehealth, but next generation medicine. So I'll open the floor up now to questions. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Elliott. Actually, we just appreciate you talking to us today about this exciting part of healthcare, both for today and into the future. And we do have some questions for you. Uh, one question is, do you use respiratory care practitioners in telehealth, telemedicine, and telemonitoring? So that's a great question. Um, at this time, I am not aware of any national organizations that are leveraging uh, uh, respiratory therapists. Um, I can certainly say that it's there's a role for it in the future. Um, and if you do have an interest in that, my, my recommendation would be to look at a couple of key hospital systems who are pioneers and leaders in this and seeing whether or not they're um, doing some pilots where they're looking um, at at, at using respiratory therapists. So I can tell you New York Presbyterian just rolled out a pilot um, and uh, Mercy Hospital as well in Missouri. Those are the two big players at the moment that, off the top of my head that I would look into. Wonderful. Uh, another question is, does visit documentation get um, imported into the electronic medical record? Yeah, so it's a great question, and it really depends on what platform you use. Um, so for, you know, something like Doctor on Demand, for example, which is more direct-to-consumer uh, and a solution for payers and, and employers, um, we have some partnerships where we um, unidirectionally push information, and it becomes part of the electronic medical record. So Epic and Athena Health, for example, but they're specific to the hospital partnerships that we have. There are a number of technologies out there that do allow for, um, if you were to, let's say, start this up for your own practice. Um, again, it's a question to ask because they don't all offer it, but there are video technologies that would allow you to sync up and have that note um, imported into your electronic record. Okay, someone else is asking, what are the three main telehealth groups out there, and is there something that is especially accessible in North Carolina? Sure. So the, the big players are Teladoc, um, which is probably the first telemedicine service to hit the market. And they used to be a um, telephone callback model. And now they've worked to kind of leverage and, and um, uh, bring a bit of video technology into the service. Um, American Well, um, and they typically deal mainly with hospital systems their software so that hospital systems can then create their own um, their own pilot programs. There's MD Live and then there's Doctor on Demand. So Doctor on Demand is the only of those that has an employed physician workforce so that to connect on demand uh, with a physician, I believe the time quoted is three minutes. So if you want to use it as uh, you know just a patient, um, you know you would download any of those three apps and, and work to connect. And if timing is of the essence, I would pick the one with the shortest wait time. Um, and then in terms of looking to work for uh, a company, um, you know they they have a multiple models. So some is an employed physician model, and then the other is an independent contractor. So you can have your regular practice and uh, you know pick up shifts here and there. Um, all of those opportunities are available in the state of North Carolina. Wonderful, thank you. What are the laws for seeing a patient via telehealth that resides in a state other than your own? So that's a good question. You need to be licensed in the state where you're practicing telehealth. And there are a couple of exceptions where if you are a specialist consultant, you can get around that, but that would mean that you would have to have the relationship with the uh, treating physician. And as if the treating physician reached out to you for a telehealth consult, because you're in an area of expertise, even if you're not licensed in the state, you're able to conduct that visit. But otherwise, if you are seeing a patient from Texas, but you're in New York, you need to have a Texas license. So for example, 
when I mentioned I've seen the 7,000 patients, I have licenses in 13 states. Well, this is so much valuable information. Another question we have is, how does a patient find out if telehealth is a covered benefit? That's a great question. Um, so you want to look at your um, benefits package when it first comes out in the mail and keep an eye out also just on the your payer website. Um, your employer HR department is also a great resource for that. And you can always uh, either check on a telehealth website to see which insurances are covered or just call your insurance company and ask. Okay. Another person is, is, has a comment with a question. You give a compelling argument of how video of patients' home will help better, will help better than the patient checklist. What about the patient's medical records or their medications? Is this still patient-entered information? That's a great question, and the answer to that is yes. And so there's a formal intake form. So just like you would be doing when you go into the doctor's office and you fill out all that stuff, usually on paper, uh, you would just do that through the application before you get connected with the physician. So you would enter in your full past medical history, your medications, your allergies, you know, any you know medications, surgeries, things like that. Um, all of that gets uploaded and saved to your chart. Well, great. What about privacy and confidentiality in regards to video use? Another great question. Um, so, you know, they, video visits are, you know, treated just the way electronic medical records are and all medical practices are. Um, so you want to make sure, that, again, when you're looking at a video solution, that it's a HIPAA compliant solution. Anything that's um, NCQA or URAC or American Telemedicine Association certified goes through a rigorous review process. Um, but the other piece of it is also just, you know, knowing who the doctor is on the other side and, you know, all doctors do undergo HIPAA training, but, you know, it's just the, the professionalism piece and making sure, for example, that the doctor is wearing headphones or is in a quiet place or is wearing their white coat and, you know, things like that that you, you know, would, would want to pick, uh, pick up on. And so we have a full training course in addition to... HIPAA breaches as they relate to a video visit. Okay. Another question is, what would happen if a patient needed a spirometry test or any other testing? Do they have to make a separate appointment, and does this mean more cost to the patient? It's a really good question. And so, yeah, there are use cases, a number of use cases, where a video visit is not going to solve the problem for you. Um, so in those cases, you know, when I was mentioning before how, like, you know, we can bring a number of allergists online and have them serve as a referral source. So, you know, let's say I had a patient coming in and they're saying, I'm having an asthma attack. I can see they're not speaking in full sentences, that they have expiratory wheezes, that they have pursed lip breathing and a number of various other aspects of physical exam through video. But then I may say, hey, you know what, when this dies down after this acute exacerbation, you need a PFT, you need a go ahead and, and get that done, then I can say, hey, here's an allergist in your area. I'm going to send you over over to them. And if you'd like, we can send their, you know, send your records over as well. Okay. Uh, someone's asking, can you bill for a video conference from your office, which is outside of a telemedicine company? A video visit for your office outside of a telemedicine company. So I uh, what I believe I'm hearing is you kind of set up your, your own kind of thing, whether it's like a makeshift, you know, not a makeshift, but, you know, you're using a FaceTime or, or something uh, to that effect. Um, I don't quite know the answer to that question, but I would assume that, you know, just like you would bill for a telephone visit, you can bill for a telehealth visit instead, and I would just call um, each of the payers that you have and ask what, documentation or CPT codes are needed since you wouldn't have the billing software built in like you would with some of the video technologies. Um, and I believe the document documentation is appropriate. You would be able to do so. Just so you know, with you know the video visits that we conduct, it's not that we record them. Um, so it's just a means by which we can create and, and you know, uh, treat a patient. Um, so it's not that, the, that you have to keep documentation of the actual video conversation itself. Well, these questions aren't all easy, but here's another one. <laughs> Can families do group visits on telehealth? Good question. Um, so each patient needs to be treated as an individual patient. So um, 
you know, if the question is, you know, three of my kids have strep throat, can I just, you know, all in one shot, you know, have three visits in one, we'd have to conduct them as three separate visits, just like if they were to, you were to come into an office and have, uh, you know, three kids in the office, they would each, you know, get, get billed as a separate visit. Um, I know that Doctor On Demand doesn't currently do group visits, um, but if you're interested in kind of doing that for your own practice, there are, you know, video technologies that allow you to do so. Okay, we have one comment that says that there's a need for legislation to ensure access for all patients, regardless of the location that they're in, whether they're in a rural area or a metropolitan area. Uh, do you That's agree with right. That? Absolutely. Let's go to Capitol Hill. Absolutely. <laughs> I completely agree with that. And, you know, we're getting there. We're certainly getting there. And I know that Allergy and Asthma Network is, um, has really been lobbying on Capitol Hill. But... Um, I completely agree, and we, we need We don't lobby, we don't lobby no, Dr. Elliott. We don't lobby, but we do work oh, on educating people. How's that? <laughs> they educate on Capitol Hill. They don't That's lobby. Right. But, um, you know, we need voices that, that state that and say that there's really there's truly a need for this and access to these services. You're right. Well, we certainly do see this as a very important piece of the healthcare picture. So here's another question now. Should an asthma action plan be done face-to-face -face prior to implementing telehealth? I think that's a good question, but I don't really see why you need to do something like that face-to-face -face prior, you know, uh, in, in anticipation of, of uh, you know, initiating a video visit. Um, you know, you have a patient and, and you know, back to the group uh, visit question, um, we don't bill for group visits, but, you know, I'd rather personally do my asthma action plan if, as a mom, if I have dad in the room and my child in the room um, and my child is the patient so that everybody could hear at the same time what the plan is. Um, and then also figuring out where you're going to keep your medications. Okay, if you do have an exacerbation, we're going to be keeping the, you know, the red colored uh, inhaler here and we know that that's the emergency one and we're going to label it and it's going to be right here in, in my house. I would argue that uh, action plans are more effective in the place where the activity is going to occur or the action is going to occur and I would argue that that's in the home. Okay. Um, and someone asked, will this presentation be available online for others who may have missed it? That's one I can actually answer for you. And that's, yes, we're recording it right now. And it will be available on our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org. Uh, after you enter the website, look for the education on the horizontal navigation bar. And then look for webinars. And you'll not only find this webinar, but all of the webinars that we have had this year. And also a link to register for our next webinar webinars. Uh, so I'm trying to see if there are uh, some more questions. Here it says, you give a compelling argument about how a video of a pair. Oh, I think we already talked. Yep, we already did that one. We've had a few that we've skipped around on. So I wanted to make sure that I got a chance to uh, look at this. Here's another question about payers. It says, what's the best way to check with payers about telehealth reimbursement? I called our major payers to check on this and have not yet received an answer. Huh. It's interesting you haven't received a response yet. Um, I mean, it really is the best way to just check with, with the payers directly. I mean, if you do have a biller, you can kind of have the biller um, hound the payer to ask that question or check on their website. Um, I wish that things were more transparent, but whatever is transparent with payers, it's always it's a bit of teeth pulling. But once you get that information, um, you know, really valuable to know. Well, Dr. Elliott, this has just been enlightening today. And I just, again, want to thank you so much for being with us. I'd like to uh, tell our listeners one more time that you can register for our upcoming web webinars on our website. We're going to be having two webinars in October as we mark Latex Allergy Awareness Week. Our first webinar will be on addressing barriers to emergency anaphylaxis care with latex allergies, and that will be on October 5th at 6 p.m. Eastern. A little later in the month, and we're still finalizing that date, we'll be looking at overcoming barriers in the real world and take a look at clinical issues, school concerns, and living with latex allergy. This will be presented at hopefully in an afternoon time slot with Dr. Sandra Gotchik and Patricia Bayer-Waltz as our guests. 
Please watch for registration information on our website. And again, that's allergyasthmanetwork.org. Click on education and then webinars to register and also find our recorded webinars. Our webinar series helps the Allergy and Asthma Network to live out our mission to end the needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. So again, please access our website for valuable information. We have sections designed specifically for patients and healthcare professionals. This webinar will be posted this week, and you can review that and also look for any of our past webinars. Well, this is Sally Schessler, Director of Education, and on behalf of the Allergy and Asthma Network, thanks so much for joining us today.